Good morning, everyone. Good afternoon, sorry. Hi, Megan, how are you? Um, I'm good. Hi, <laughs> Regina. Um, right, so it's, I'm just waiting. To, I'm still admitting quite a few people, so mm. I'm just making sure. Also, I tried to print something just now on my printer. It's not working, so I may have to switch the screen every now and then. Okay. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Hi, Hi Jonathan. Hi, Priya. Good afternoon. Hi. Hello. It's very interesting seeing how Zoom works with so many people on it. I've never used it with such a big group. Oh. Have you you've used it with with this larger group? Yeah, actually, I, I presented yeah. at the uh, the literary conference that just went, mm. and um, we had well, techs at UWE were liaising with the presenters, and I that was how I realized how capable Zoom was of quite a lot of things. Okay. and sharing screens and all these things. Great. So, um, ultimately, so um, ultimately, Megan, will it be better for the rest of us to switch our cameras off once we've started or what, what works better for you? I, I don't think, I, I don't think it matters. My, mm. so long as everyone is hearing me clearly and everyone has a good internet connection, it should be fine. Okay. Yeah. Right, so good afternoon again, everyone. Um, my name is Megan Cleghorn. Those of you who are in my tutorial for Comes 2101 will know me. Um, everyone else, it's nice to meet you um, via, you know, virtually. And um, welcome to our first live Comes 2101 lecture for this semester. Uh, we, may, we will definitely have a few more with the lecturer coming up. Um, Dr. Shepard, I would just like to say thank you so much for the opportunity before I start yes, to welcome. deliver the lecture today. I yeah. hope that you all um, enjoy. Feel free mm. to ask questions after. Um, we may t run a little bit into the tutorial time. I'm trying to keep it to, to 50 minutes. And so let's just get started. Yeah. So I'll give Megan, you... Megan, yeah. could I just say a word or two? Because I think... Sure. Uh, not all of the students here will will know you. Um, just yes. from my perspective, the reason I, one of the reasons I wanted um, to invite Ms. Cleghorn to do the lecture is because as a scholar and student, she has a background in literatures. And that's one of the perspectives I've never looked at storytelling from, even though I've used it in my own writing and research, both I've used it as a journalist, um, when I taught communication to medical students, we use personal narratives when talking about self-disclosure between the doctor and patient. But I've never had this insight from someone who has this background in literatures. And that was one of my key interests in being edified by this particular lecture. So I'm very excited that you're doing it today and I can sit back and listen to this lecture. I'm glad. Yes, and I am glad to have the opportunity. So, yeah, so a little bit about myself. Um, that's it, Dr. Shepard, for you? Yes, for that's it. Okay. Thank you. All right, thank you. Um, so, a little bit about myself, for those of you who don't know me. Um, as Dr. Shepard was saying, my, my background is in literature. I have my undergrad from UE. I've been at UE for going on 11 years now. I hope I don't look it. Um, <laughs> and if I do, just lie to me. Uh, so my undergrad degree is in literature, my master's degree is in literature, and right now I'm doing my cultural studies uh, PhD, um, but it's a literary based PhD. So it's uh, literary and cultural studies, a combination of, of both. Um, it's very exciting for me, literature is my passion, but I have been uh, lecturing and tutoring mostly in communication studies for the past about seven years at UE. Um, and I have at some point proposed a course to the, de the development of a course in, um, that combines literary methods with communication studies. Uh, I have not been taken seriously yet, but um, trust me, I won't give up on it. So eventually, maybe we will be able to offer that in a communication studies program. I've also tutored and part-time lectured in literature and sometimes in linguistics 
which I know Dr. Shepard is very familiar with um, the field of linguistics. So um, again, welcome. Um, I'm going to, <clears throat> so forgive me, I'm not a tech expert, so please, if there are any, I'll do my best to avoid technical difficulties or issues, but I was saying my printer has been giving trouble and I was trying to print some notes and I was not able to have them physically printed. So I'll have, may have to switch between the PowerPoints and my notes at some point. Um, so quickly, let me just check my notes before I put up the PowerPoint. So I'll be sharing my screen with you all. And um, so at some points you probably won't see my whole face. And again, the technical difficulties have already begun because I can't find my notes. So, so I'll just go with the, uh, the problem. Megan, if there yeah. are questions, do you want them at the end or, would, or left for yeah. tutorial? What, what do you yeah. think would be the thing? I think I would prefer if, if we always waited for questions at the end. It shouldn't be too long of a presentation. And um, maybe just jot them down so that you remember what the questions were. Right. And we can have a little question session at the end if you have questions. Yeah. Right. So I'm just trying to find my desktop, which is being difficult right now. And I can't find it. So anyway, I'll go to the PowerPoint. Um, share screen. Right. So everyone can see my screen? Yes, Miss. Okay, yes, Miss. Yes, Miss. Um, I'm just trying to make it right slideshow from the beginning. So I titled it How Literature and Oral Traditions Shape Our Reality, Symbolic Convergence Theory. So I've I've um I'm going to try to incorporate some of my literature background with symbolic convergence theory, which is a theory that combines uh, basically the oral tradition, the tradition of storytelling and dramatization with communication studies methods. Um, Dr. Shepard might post that paper up for you all. I'm not sure if he will, but it's a really good read uh, where um, a, a paper on symbolic convergence, if you should find it interesting today, um, you can always go and take a read of that if he will most likely post it up. I, I did post it. It's already Oh, there. great. So it's probably yeah. there. Yeah. So you probably, some of you might have read it already. Um, right. So I'm going to just talk a little bit about literature, oral traditions, and communications. Um, in, and this is where I need to switch to my notes. I do, <laughs> you guys, I'm really sorry. Um, I just need to find, okay, I'm going to do this very quickly. So do forgive me for not flowing to 100%. Um, but for some reason, oh, thank God I found it. Okay. You all are seeing the screen still. Let me just stop sharing for a second. Megan, I know I've had this issue as well. When PowerPoint goes to display, obviously it hides yeah. all the notes. I don't know if you, you know, the other way to do it is to view notes on a phone and have right. the full screen. I don't know. I don't know. And, and the thing is, up, to, up until the second before I started, I was um, trying to print. Anyway, I found yeah. it. Right. Okay. So um, the use of storytelling in communication. So there are repetitive themes narratives and discourses that recur in our everyday lives, as you all know. And these usually happen through storytelling. Um, literature's ancient origins are rooted in oral storytelling traditions. And to a large extent, we unconsciously follow a similar way of life today through movies, for example, and a regurgitation of information via word of mouth. Uh, what that means is, so before we had the written word, as all of you will know, um, and if you trace back the human existence, ancient times, uh, the, the tradition of oral storytelling was something that was very uh, pivotal and actually I think the evolution of the human consciousness, where through language, before there was the written word, um, people would have passed on stories. 
dramatization, uh, things that um, are actually not so unfamiliar to us today. So I'm sure that all of us have grandparents and possibly some parents who quite often tell us stories. We have sayings that we hear over and over again. Um, and these things have a tendency to develop narratives, unconscious sometimes narratives in our own minds and the ways that we, in the ways we live our lives. Um, for example, in, so for example, things your grandmother or parents would have said to you about how boys should be versus how girls should be. Anyone who's familiar with gender theory um, today, you know, the contemporary gender theory would know that acad academics in gender theory have been trying to change discourses about the, the typical and traditional viewing of boys and girls. Boys ha must like blue, girls must like pink, etc. And I'm sure even though there is a bit of a generational gap, I'm sure between most of, between most of you and me, that it's still not so uncommon to hear these things just thrown around in regular society by the older generation, by our parents, etc. That, um, you know, that there are set ways of being for boys to be and for girls to be. That there are set, some set uh, beliefs about religion, about certain types of religion, about certain ways of life. Um, and these are things that we tend to internalize and that uh, uh, come to us from various ideologies that ex existed long before we were born and that tend to propagate and um, continue via an oral tradition that happens in, in, in the family, in the community, in the society. Um, so the history of oral tradition is actually not so ancient. And even though we have literature and literature has flourished and bloomed, meaning the written word. Um, it is actually the oral traditions that have continued to form ideologies. And these oral traditions have also continued to inform literature. And literature is something that actually informs dramatization. Because as I always tell my, so I also teach high school and to get my high school children to have an appreciation for literature, as you all know, there, is a, there, there are two pandemics happening and it's not just COVID, but that children don't like to read anymore because they generally are so attached to these devices and to, I just want to ask, everyone is still seeing my video, right? Yeah? Yes, we're seeing your video, not, okay, not the slides as yet. Right, right. Yeah, okay. I don't have the slides up as yet. Sure. So, um, yes, yeah, so as we're all familiar, you know, with this, this epidemic of children, disliking reading now because they have so many devices to distract them. I always inform, especially the ones that don't see any point of value in reading, they tend to like movies, they tend to like comics, they tend to like cartoons and things like that. They tend to like all these YouTube videos and um, TikToks and things that I just can't keep up with anymore. I really have no idea what TikTok or Snapchat or those things are, how to use them. But these children are very versed in them. And what I try to tell them is there are no movies without the written word. Someone sat and thought of a story that was based in types of narratives and ideologies that that person would have then, um, uh, you know, enhanced into becoming a story, a story with a plot, a story with a narrative, a story with a setting. And from these stories, these written stories, because even comic books, even graphic novels uh, come from a type of storytelling. Um, they would have then been developed into movies, the things that we love to look at on screen that we're riveted to. Uh, comedians that we like to look at who make these very short TikTok videos and things like that, they too, they have scripts. Um, even stand-up comics, who I really love stand-up comics, who stand and deliver material orally, um, they have to have a story, they have to have the written word before. They, are, they have writers, they have comedy writers. And even your, your, this is something for you all to note, you're in an oral communications class. And every time you have to deliver a speech, you still have to write a script, even if you're not writing. And in my class, I say, you know, I don't want you to read out word for word an entire script because this is about judging your oral communication ability, your ability to orate. You still have to write something or at least jot something down when you're planning, when you're planning an outline. Even if you were to stand in front of a crowd with flashcards, you're going to 
be following, you know, drafted out poems. And in that way, you are doing some writing. So the written word, I would say, at this stage in our, in, you know, the human evolution, um, we're not etching on stones anymore, things like that. But I would say that it's almost, it's, it can't be removed from, from rhetoric, from uh, efficient oration. So there was something else I wanted to talk to you all about, and that is the particular situation we're in these days, before I get into symbolic conversion theory, um, which is talking on screen. So I know that particularly with my class, um, at least because that's my experience with my Comp Comps 2101 class, my, my other class, which is a public speaking and voice training class this semester. No one ever wants to turn on their video. And fortunately for you, you're in a good position to, you know, to exercise your rights not to do so. But, uh, for, you know, for us uh, lecturers and tutors, we have had no choice but to get accustomed with it. And I wanted to urge you all as, young tertiary education students, university students, that you have to become comfortable, I know by force, unfortunately, um, because we all have to become comfortable with the new normal by force, uh, with the idea that for you specifically, for your generation, jobs and um, job opportunities are going to be very different now. You're not more than likely going to have to go in for face-to-face -face interviews anymore and in a way this is kind of not just it's not it's limiting in a way but it's also actually kind of opening the world up to you because now that everything has gone online um it's actually going to be more acceptable for you to apply to a job in a, a completely different country for you to apply to a university to do your master's probably in a completely different country. Even the university is heading the way of opening up our classrooms to the rest of the world if everything is going to be mostly online from now on because it's a resource that we can actually use. And in that way, um, even our teaching of oral communication is going to change because before we were always in a class and you have no choice, you can't, well, you or you wouldn't come to school with a mask covering your whole face. You have, you have to show your face. And um, I want you to get comfortable with showing your face on camera, with angling, with, um, and I have, I've done this with my tutorials already, uh, the idea of angling your computer correctly, of having, you know, a square um, sort of vision of, in terms of being seen, having the camera angle for your upper body, uh, proper lighting, things like that, and practicing it now. I mean, this is the class to practice it in because this is the class that you're going to be judged on your oral speaking skills, but not just that, your ability to present visually, um, body language wise. Um, last week, I think it was Dr. Shepard had us go through the video about, or the week last class, about body language and how important that is in oration. And so for today, um uh we all the tutors will be doing the same things with you the same kinds of little uh, tutorial activities but for today the there is one that i have included that is asking you specifically to put your video on so i'm hoping that after today's lecture we might get a little bit more comfortable or at least challenge ourselves to do so um so the importance, first of all, of getting comfortable with the screen, the importance of getting comfortable talking about yourself. That's one of the things that's going to come up in today's lecture. Uh, Self-referencing. Um, so I'm going to talk a bit about anecdotes, about flesh and blood stories, about involving yourself in a narrative when giving an oral presentation. Also something I've covered in my tutorial that every time you should have to plan a speech, every time you should have to engage with an audience, you should always try your best, if it's possible, to include something that you are passionate about, include something that you are genuinely interested in, because that genuine interest from yourself always relates to the audience, always comes across to the audience as something that they would possibly want to participate in because it's like a word of mouth type of advertising 
where I've never thought about this thing before, but if I see another human um, that has, whose life has been changed by this particular thing or this particular method of doing things or thinking about things, then maybe that can affect me too, because we all have that one thread of, of humanity that connects all of us, right? So self-referencing, involving yourself in the story that you are giving back to an audience or giving out to an audience. Hi, um, Nance. Sorry, yes. um, there are persons waiting to come into the lecture. Sorry. That is because I'm not looking at my Zoom. Thank you so much. <laughs> no problem. Yes. Um, right. Admitted. Thank you. Please let me know if that happens again. Right. Now I have to find back my um, notes. <laughs> this is... Found it. Lovely. Yes. So everyone is following so far. Am I going too fast? Or anything? Everybody's okay? Okay. So... Okay, good. Right, so I was at the point of self-referencing. Um, when the audience knows you, you personally relate, personally relate to a topic, they actually connect much better with the material, even if it's, even if it is alien to them, right? And then on the point of anecdotes, which is one, one of the things you're going to be engaging with in tutorials today, um, you are, which I'm talking about adding stories in different ways to your presentations. And these would include, of course, personal narrative, anecdotes and self-referencing, which I spoke of a little bit before. So now I'm actually going to um, share my screen with you again and try to get this PowerPoint back up. Um, So everyone is with me today again now. Good. Right, so we just covered literature, a little bit of oral traditions and their relevance to communication. Um, right, what is, what is the oral traditions relevance to communication? It, as I was explaining before, everything is communication, but I would also say Everything is also literature. Everything is also storytelling. Um, I don't know if any of you or anyone here is familiar with, you know, modernist theory, modernism, etc. But it basically talks about the idea that there, there is no ultimate truth, but rather alternative truths, various versions of the truth. If anyone is studying law, you also know that that's true of in the law <laughs> profession. And um, and essentially, by the way we develop discourses, the way we develop narratives, the way we imbibe ideologies, the way we understand things, that's the way we understand various truths. And the way we communicate those things is all about how those things are shaped. So for you to be uh, an, an effective and an efficient oral speaker, orator, you would have to be able to be able to tell your truth, your version of the truth um, in such a convincing way that your communication, the way you communicate it is effective, right? Um, I just spoke about these things that you're seeing on the screen now, yourself on the screen, the self-narratives, the anecdotes, um, self-referencing, relatability, human connection. If you have any questions about that, we can always come back. And now we're going to move on a bit to symbolic convergence theory. So symbolic convergence theory was developed to, to identify instances of convergence and meanings by interacting members of small groups and to explain the, con the constitutive communication processes and the consequences of such convergence, both within and beyond the small group. So it basically deals with how ideas, narratives, and narratives converge within group consciousness or group think. I don't know if any of you have ever heard of that. Um, and per, forgive me if I, if I pronounce the right, the um, author of this paper's name, name wrong, but I think I forgot already. I checked Google earlier on how to pronounce it, but I believe it's 
all of fault. That's how what it sounded like. Um, anyway, so um, right. So symbolic convergence theory basically covers the ways in which we can incorporate um, the way that discourses rhetor and rhetorics are developed into our communication processes and also analyze the way that um, these ideologies develop uh, via dramatizations and we'll get a little bit more into that um, in our society and how that then influences our own ideology. So SCT, as it's shortened, um, recognized that communication creatively constructs and is constrained by reality. So it both constructs reality and is constrained by reality. And I'll get a little bit more into that later on when I talk about the cyclical, cyclical consciousness, right? So basically SCT, symbolic convergence theory, it, um, it creates this type of cyclical consciousness where um, out of the stories, so the, the, conscious, the, the consciousness is coming out of the stories and out of the stories come these things that we will be discussing, rhetorical visions, uh, etc. So that's what they mean by, um, sorry, I'm just admitting a couple of people into the room. Yes. By symbolic convergence theory, constructing reality as well as being constrained by it. We, we create narratives based on ideologies that already exist, but out of our story creation also derives new ideologies. And so the cycle continues. I hope you're following with me. Again, if you have questions, keep it till the end. I'm just checking the chats. Yes, I can upload the PowerPoint after. No problem. Great. Um, good. So, well, the lecturer should do that for you, actually. I'll send it to him. So, symbolic convergence theory and dramatization. So, symbolic convergence theory is basically, it's based on the idea of dramatization, on the idea that, um, that in dramatization, narratives develop through narratization, dramatization. And that's why I began with the, with the tradition of, or, of orality, of the oral traditions. Um, with the oral tradition of storytelling, because that was in fact our first human form of dramatization, the retelling of stories. Um, SCT points to the finding that dramatization symbolism leads to public consciousness. From, the, from these emerge various rhetorical visions, which lead to sustained discourses and ideologies. These in turn shape society. Um, Symbolic convergence theories, breakthroughs in communication studies come through an understanding of the system of the convergence of meaning. So what I'm essentially saying and what Olo, this author is essentially saying is that through, through dramatization, through the retelling of stories and through the reconfiguration uh, of ideologies and the same ideologies in different forms, um, we what emerges is something called rhetorical visions and these lead to sustained discourses um meaning meaning things that we accept discourses that we accept and ideologies that we accept as as belief systems that shape society um and this is the reason why it has become important in communication studies so previously at in the beginning of communication, of theorizing and communication studies, um, analysts would go look at so, um, sociological theories and psychological theories. And it was with the advent of symbolic, symbol, symbolic convergence theories and its application to communication <laughs> studies that someone is asking a question. That's, that we were able to, uh, it was with the application of symbolic convergence theory to communication studies that we were able to start understanding um, the system of the convergence of meanings, meaning that they come, meaning, meaning systems come together and they come together via um, shared ideologies and these shared ideologies of course form 
from a certain type of storytelling, a certain type of dramatization. Now, I just want to point out, we have nine minutes, 30 seconds again. At about two minutes, I think what I'll do when we have just two minutes remaining, I will end the Zoom session and I'm just going to ask you all to rejoin immediately on the same link. Is that okay? Sure, Miss. Miss, okay. can you just repeat no uh, problem. how meaning systems come together again, please? Right. So I have a question, how meaning systems come together? Great. Just check in the chat. Right. So as I was saying, symbolic convergence theory discusses the way that ideologies, discourses, and narratives are formed um, based on storytelling. When I say storytelling, symbolic, I'm sorry, I'm just miss. Could you add? Oh, people are still waiting. I'm not seeing anyone actually right now. Still waiting in the... No one is waiting at the moment. I think everyone has gotten in. Yes. Uh, symbolic convergence theory deals with the convergence of meaning systems. These meaning systems are ideologies, discourses, and narratives, meaning we understand our society in a certain way. And those are through belief systems. You all following? Everyone is following? You could say yes. yes. Yeah, we're following. And those belief systems, um, I'm, I'm making a connection between the way those systems are interpreted at, through dramatizations. Now, I'm going to get a little bit actually more into detail with that later on. So let me continue and I'll get back to it if, um, if it's still unclear by the time we're done. So rhetoric, rhetorical visions. Rhetorical visions emerge through the chaining of fantasy themes. So remember, again, we're talking about ideological systems and discourses being um, forming based on storytelling. Storytelling in our society, meaning dramatizations. When you think of dramatizations, you're actually thinking of plays, of movies, etc. cetera, right? Um, Rhetorical visions emerge through the chaining of fantasy, the fantasy themes and fantasy types. But they are more abstract than fantasy themes and types. So we'll get into the, what fantasy themes and types are in a little bit. Um, as they have greater space, sorry, time, space, depth, stronger systems of shared meaning and socio-historical permeation. So according to symbolic convergence theory, there are three different types of rhetorical visions. Now, when we talk of rhetorical visions, again, we are thinking of ideological systems, okay? The way that we envision things, the way that um, we understand meanings. When we talk of convergence of meanings, we're talking about different meaningful systems actually converging, coming together. So I want you to think of it visually in that way, right? According to SCT, there are three different types of rhetorical visions. These are pragmatic rhetorical visions, which deal with practical and utilitarian goals. Social um, rhetorical visions, which are grounded in relationships and seek unity and peace and righteous rhetorical visions, uh, meaning that it deal, they deal with high morals and an opposition to evil. I hope that you're beginning to understand rhetorical visions now as ideologies that um, that are pre-existing sometimes. So for example, in a righteous rhetorical vision, meaning that there is this shared vision by a group, right? What establishment would probably subscribe to a righteous rhetorical vision? Anyone? A church. A church, right? A religious organization. Excellent. A pragmatic rhetorical vision would over, overrule the, ideo the ideology of what type of um, organization? The government. The government. Excellent. And a social rhetorical vision would be subscribed to by? Uh, institutions or? Like schools, maybe? School, yeah, institutions. Possibly yes. schools, any type of establishment that prioritizes relationships, a peace organization, possibly NGOs, you know, that yeah. seek unity and peace, right? So we're looking again at the overriding systems of meaning 
that pre-exist in our societies. And I say pre-exist, but they actually, they start somewhere. And we are looking at how these systems of meaning converge within communication, how we contribute to creating them as well as how we subscribe to them even sometimes unconsciously, right? Um, continuing, we talked about cyclical, right? So all these three, if you look at these three types of rhetorical vision, and we think about the various types of organizations that uh, subscribe to them, as we just discussed, we see that it's a cyclical consciousness. Out of these types of rhetorical visions come types of stories, if you follow me. So out of a writer's rhetorical vision would come the story of, of biblical moral consciousness. Um, you would see that type of story repeating in types of movies, right? And out of that type of consciousness come stories, but then out of the stories come these, because what came first? I mean, one would say, did the Bible come before biblical ideology or did biblical ideology come before the Bible? Have you ever thought of that? You understand? So it becomes a kind of cycle to which we can't find the, the origins of these, um, of these, yes, thank you for that comment. It is an interesting thought, right? Uh, we can't find the origin of, of these things that we just sometimes blindly subscribe to. Um, and I just want to make a note there that while as a literature student, uh, whilst I believe that literature is inculcated into everything and that it is absolutely imperative to the understanding of almost everything, I also think that history is and understanding history, how things were created, how things were made, where things got started, or rather where we, we, we began to record um, how things got started and came to be the way that they are. Uh, right? So we have two minutes and 22 seconds remaining. Um, so I don't have that many more slides, so I'm going to take a slight break here, end the meeting, and ask you all to please rejoin. Um, as to, I will restart the meeting. So give us about 30 seconds and come back in. Is everyone okay for now with that? Yes, miss. Yes, miss. Yeah. Okay. Great. See you all in half a minute. Okay. Um,